Not one person in the world should feel bad that they've never tried a VR headset. There is nothing to it. It is nothing. It is a great way to get motion sick. My wife gets on TikTok and it's embarrassing to me to even admit that. Sorry, go ahead. I'm talking too much. Welcome to season three, episode two, Pivoting Through Life. I've got two guests joining me today. I've got Bob Hansen from Simple.biz and Corbin Hogan. Actually, my son, he is active in running the repair business for us in the back end of the office. And if you're joining me for the first time, my name is Brad Hogan. I'm a business guy here in Central Florida, just talking about pivoting through life and what it takes. Guys, appreciate you being here. Bob Corbin. I'm honored to be here. <laughs> Let's just go into it. Talking about technology, how technology has changed, kind of disrupted what we were doing. Where to begin, right? As a young professional, somebody who's 29 today, maybe not so young, maybe not as young as I used to be. Maybe that goes for all of us. I feel I've learned so much going into the different workplaces that I've been. Working in a restaurant, to working in broadcasting, to now working in roofing. For as long as I've been around in the professional workplace, technology's always been there. Uh, if we're just talking AI, that topic has probably been done to death for enough people. When we talk about AI, we're talking about ChatGPT. And if you read the different articles and you know, read Wall Street Journal, read any, it's fear. People have fear. They're worried if they're an accountant that AI will replace them. If they are content creators, they think, okay, well, this ChatGPT can do it better. Tax prep people. Work. But you don't feel that way, do you? No, I haven't. But if you want to know what AI will do, because obviously AI will have a huge impact on a lot of industries, especially knowledge industries, how is it going to affect you? Well, I think you would want to go back and look at all the other changes that have happened in, in technology in the last 20 years. I own a business that couldn't exist without a set of different tools that only existed in the last 10 years. And so by way of introduction, I'm Bob Hansen. I'm the founder of Simple.biz. Simple.biz is a network of 290 different web designers in 70 of the largest markets in the United States and Canada. We're local web designers who all build websites for contractors like Brad according to a common standard which we have found always will rank first page on Google for Google search, especially in suburban size cities. It's worked really well to create leads for our clients using really focus on video and on smart forms on websites. We have a technology platform that's done really well to help over 4,000 small business owners get found in their local markets. Again, it's not me building these sites, We, although I build plenty of them. It's 290 local web designers. Now, if you look at all the websites we build, and our network will build well over 100 websites a week, and sometimes much, much more than that, maybe in a slow week less than that, what we have, which is pretty awesome, it only could have existed with a set of tools that, again, didn't exist 10 years ago. You guys have heard of Fiverr. Sure. F-I-V-E-R-R.com. Yep. I started building websites 20 years ago. Back in 2017, I got on Fiverr as a way of helping other local web designers do what I do very well, but which local web designers tend not to do very well, which is find clients. And so what I would do is I'd partner with them in their local markets and I'd help them get connected with local business owners. And in the same way, every local business owner wants a local web designer to help them with their website. And so I'm supplying web designers to clients and I'm supplying clients to web designers. Well, Fiverr didn't exist 20 years ago. Fiverr is a platform, but it's also its own technology. And there's a lot of people, when this platform came out, that said, hey, for $5, I'll build you a logo, or for $5, I'll upgrade your SEO, or for $5, I'll build you a landing page. Well, a lot of people were afraid. They thought, well, this is going to kill me because somebody in Pakistan or somebody in India is willing to do something for $5 that I can't afford to do for $500. They created a lot of fear, but it didn't need to be. By getting on the Fiverr platform, within a couple of years, I had a thousand five-star reviews on Fiverr. I had 290 partners across the country. Literally every one of them I met through the Fiverr platform. And so what initially for a web designer had to be a source of fear because, oh, this is going to hurt my business. This is going to drive down costs. It's going to you know, create too much competition. What it did instead was it connected me to my partners. We really need each other, right? This network has been huge for both of us. It helps me help them in the way they're the weakest. Upwork also exists. I, Upwork hasn't been as big a tool for me as Fiverr has been. Fiverr would have struck fear into creative people the way AI does today, but it didn't need to. You know something about the technology, though, as I think about that. I think about industry in the 60s, 70s, even in the 80s. Yeah. 
we were building automobiles and everything else here in the U.S., which is mostly outsourced now based on cost. The same fear was talked about then in the yeah. 70s. Oh my gosh, machinery, it's laser welders in the factory, and we're not going to have job. Now, it, instead of five guys, it's one guy that watches three machines, right? That's technology. And still, we outsourced all of that industry because the labor is cheaper. While fiber still exists today, are you tying into other technology? Yeah. Chat GPT. Now it seems like it's more globalization too. I mean, I can hire an employee in the Philippines. Yeah. Well, the thing is now, the fact that this is a person in basically a developing country who has reliable enough internet to work for you, that's a game changer. Because 10 years ago, you couldn't have hired some personal assistant in the Philippines because she wouldn't have had good internet. She would have no access to internet. And these are huge transformative technologies that have done nothing but, well, I guess to some people, maybe there's an American who would like to be your personal assistant, but I don't think you'd have an American personal assistant if you couldn't get one from the Philippines who is so much more affordable. And then the American who you might have hired can be going to do something else. She can hire her own personal assistant from the Philippines. Right? Well, and like you, do you have any people that are from the States? Yeah, you got tons of them, right? Yeah. And I've got assistants too that are here. Yeah. Different things. I mean, I, I can't be virtual on everything. Right? Yeah. You've got to have some people who are hands-on. And it is true that from the dollar standpoint, I mean, it's a lot more expensive to have those people, but necessary. It is necessary. And us, we're not, we're 100% virtual. So it, we really don't feel like there's anything that has to be done in person. But content creation needs to be done onshore. Customers don't like offshore content creation. If you ask, you know, what are the three things you want in a website? They want it made here. They want it made local. For that reason, I couldn't offshore the content creation. You know, there's some administrative tasks I can offshore. Back when automation, which is going on for 100 years, more and more took over auto factories. And when, when computers came out and automated offices and the predictions are always, you know, unemployment will ensue. Right, no one's going to have any jobs. And, right, and now we've Fear. we've seen decades of that, and we've got three percent unemployment. Honestly, the three percent unemployment. If I didn't have a job, I could go drive Uber tomorrow. And what is that? That's a technology that is drinking up every unemployed person in America. Right, I could deliver. I could I could probably make pretty decent money delivering groceries today in our office. Instead, we do three days a week check-ins. We do automated reporting that goes out daily. The office knows their daily tasks. And anything that has to be reported on or directed to us. Today, they report on all of that in an email uh, with attached files, and we get to see at a glance how their day is going. Isn't it weird now to meet in person with a group? Yeah. You want your laptop in front of you <laughs> so that you have your KPIs in front of you, right? Yeah. And then you want to be able to action things. And yeah. so by the time you sit around a conference table and everyone's got their laptop, we should be at home. <laughs> it's weird, actually, to get together We now. could have done this from home. Right? Yeah. I'm like, it's great to see you. But this meeting will go slower. It will be less uh, data-driven because I don't have my laptop in front of me. And we're not looking at the same thing at all times. When I have done in-person meetings, we'll sit in a round and we'll all get on a Zoom together so that you can share your screen with me, you can share your screen with me, and we can all be looking. At You're in person but on Zoom? Please Zooming in person. Because Stop it. Those meetings are so much more productive because instead of talking about just general things, we can say, okay, what is our time to edit? Or what's the, you know, everyone has KPIs. And we should be looking at those charts together if we're discussing those charts together. And then we can disaggregate them together and figure out what the drivers are. But just talking, I mean, I don't know. It's almost like, let's just go for coffee. I don't see how we're going to achieve anything if we're going to talk about issues. And there are numbers attached to those issues, but we don't know the numbers. You have hundreds of employees. Partners, but go on. Okay, partners. Okay, yeah. partners. If you didn't have some of that technology, yeah. would it be possible? No, no. And because, for one thing, we all have to build to the same standard. We developed our own uh, what you see is what you get a platform, more secure than WordPress, but it's cloud-based, meaning that if you, my partner in Cleveland, mm -hmm. build a website before it goes out, I'm already on it. I'm already looking at it and we have four people on our in-house team that can go through four different checklists before it goes to a client. Quality control. Quality control. And so without the cloud, right, that wouldn't happen. And there's a lot of people who are displaced by the cloud. I knew a guy who used to go and he would go into offices and he would wire them up with Cat5 cable. He lost his job. Well, I don't know what he's doing now, but he's probably got another job because he was kind of technological. If we were just operating off of a server in our office, I couldn't collaborate with a guy in Cleveland to 
be checking the quality of his work to make sure it fits standards, right? There's a major technology that was disruptive, but in the end, for the vast majority of us, it was just a blessing, right? But wouldn't you agree we have to constantly evolve because mm -hmm. that that example you just gave about the guy being displaced? Yeah. That's it forever. This machine is going to put me out of a job. Yeah. From an education standpoint, education is the future. One guy that runs one machine or one guy that hooks up Cat5 cable is displaced, but we need 10 people over here to build the machine. Somebody's got to maintain the machine. Somebody's got to engineer the machine. We lost a guy that was manually installing Cat5 or Connect hardware. Well, now we've got people that need to develop the next thing, the next thing. And I know some of those people. It's a different job, and that is disruptive. There's something called Zapier. Zapier is a tool that connects different uh, platforms. If you are, let's say, an administrative employee, and your job is with each sale to complete these 20 steps, right, to send out a billing terms email, to make sure the card is run, to add them into Stripe, to do various things, right? You have this sort of repetitive, mindless thing, and you're thankful for a job, but you realize that it's a bit of a drudgery. Understand that that's a good sign for you that your job is going to be replaced soon because those are the jobs that automation is perfect at. And so what used to be several people that work for me, I didn't lay anyone off, but obviously those jobs had to go away because automation makes that easier. And automation is kind of scary. Specifically to AI, I think that people are afraid because it's going to like replace a whole profession. I think you should dive into what is AI really at this moment able to do? Is it able to replace a person in a job or is it able to just be a tool for a person. And in truth, I don't think it's yet replaced anyone. I don't think that we have yet to see an AI layoff. The other day, I wanted to write a blog post for my own website, and it was basically on complacency. If you were to interview a CEO and you said, hey, how's it going with your company? And you said, oh, everything's great. You're probably not a very good CEO. You know, as a CEO of a company, you should ah, be thinking all the time 100%. about what issues you have. So I tried to write this article, right? I said to ChatGPT, I said, write me a thousand word article on the danger of complacency for a business owner. And it spit out in a few seconds, a thousand word article that sounded terrible. It was very stiff and boring. It didn't make the actual points that I wanted. So I had to say, as you have to with ChatGPT, I said, redo this but make these two your supporting arguments. And then it redid it, it was better. And then now so far, what jobs are eliminated? I'm still the one writing the blog. One, a computer can't order it up, but two, even a human ordering it up, it's not gonna come out the way they want it, so they have to reorder it. So the second order had my points correctly, but it still had this very awkward, formal kind of way of talking that sounded just really badly written. So do you think it's made the process better? Mm, much faster. Yeah. Much faster. Finally said a third time, I said, redo this, make it a bit funny. Because I wanted it to be a little bit lighter. Came out and it used a lot of really corny metaphors. I'm, I'm two minutes into the process, right, of writing a thousand words which is not bad. That's probably a, a five or six minute read and it's done it in just a couple of minutes. But in the end, I still had to rewrite the opening paragraph entirely and the closing paragraph entirely because there was no call to action. And then I had to clean up the corniness because it sounded awful. I'd be embarrassed to have my name on it. Sure. It saved me a lot of time. You can't replace it. And to the degree that people have tried, I don't know if you guys have read about this, but this attorney uses ChatGPT to write a brief that he actually files in New York District Court. His license is up for suspension. I read about this one. If it's about him, him filing it yeah. as false cases cited as arguments. Yeah. And so in the same way, if I go to the optometrist in the chat GPT decide, or whatever computer decides, you know, what prescription I need, well, there's a liability around that. So I don't think... You're still responsible. Yeah. I mean, it can be a good... Come on. It really just lets us do more work. It doesn't let us have fewer workers necessarily. What's cool about all those platforms, though, if you take an Uber Eats or DoorDash or let's say Uber, the platforms all lose money. There's a site called Toro that I love to rent cars from. And Toro will give you a car to rent. You do have to pay some fees and the owner doesn't get all the money that you pay. But here's what's interesting about Toro is they lose every dollar that they bring in plus that much again, which means if I wanted to take that car and rent it out and I wanted to build my own website, advertise it myself on Google, I have certain costs associated with it, but I get to keep all the money. By going to Turo, maybe I lose 25% of the money, but that's not nearly the cost of it. In other words, Turo is losing money on my behalf. And so, yeah, they might not like Uber Eats taking a share. They might not like DoorDash taking a share. But in fact, those guys are losing money, which means the money they're paying ostensibly for advertising doesn't cover the cost of that advertising. They're getting a 
steal on those. Oh, understood. Because all of those platforms, even Fiverr, lost a fortune. I don't know if they're still losing money, but you know, those are all subsidized by investors who are willing to lose money to watch those platforms grow. But the cool thing is that that, maybe it's not a cool thing, but let's say the $300 that Turo makes, they haven't made. They've actually spent sure. 600 in order to accommodate all of it because they've paid money for advertising. They've paid to develop the platform. My son and I looked this up. Turo, their revenue last year equaled their losses, which means for every dollar they took in, they spent $2. And so that's a subsidy. Basically, investors are paying to get this thing to grow. And Turo is growing so fast. It's an awesome system. I've I got tons of reviews. I don't rent out cars on Turo. I don't even own a car. But what I do is I rent cars from Turo all the time. I drove a Tesla Model why to get here which it doesn't have a key it's on my phone i rented it through toro you were you were in a mid-engine corvette the day you came to my house yeah yeah that, that guy's corvette i love renting his car but like <laughs> he 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 probably thinks oh i wish i could just rent on the side to this guy so i don't have to pay the fees at toro this whole thing of being able to rent out his car to vetted screened strangers exists because toro and the investors behind it are willing to lose literally billions of dollars and the reach yeah right i mean you're not gonna have the same reach doing what yeah and so this is the age we live in if you're a wedding planner you get to get on the knot because and the knot is way cheaper you know they're losing a ton which means what you pay them you hate to pay them but it's still less than you should have to pay them or less than it would cost you to develop your own wedding planning business well, it's, no, it's no different me with you yeah i mean i could do my own website right yeah 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 but you've got the system down. We got the system down, but we're not a platform. We don't lose money on every deal. No, no, but I'm saying yeah. still. But I think if somebody was starting a business today, I think the first thing you need to ask yourself is, is there a platform, ideally one that's just starting out, that I can get myself on to get my name out there where I don't have to pay for advertising. I'm only paying them a percentage of revenue. Even if it's a big percentage, like 30%, you hate to pay it. Now, once the platforms develop, like I think you shouldn't name names, but in the contractor space, there's a lot of these platforms that sell leads and they're quite profitable and they're quite a ripoff. It's not going to be a win every time, but I think that somebody would be wise if they're starting a business to say, okay, am I a content creator? Let me get on Fiverr. Am I a contractor? Let me get on Angie's List to see how it goes don't spend a lot of money on it but just see how it goes because you'll find it either does well or doesn't but my story with fiverr i mean there's literally no way i would have met these guys if i wasn't on fiverr i mean my web designers are there and it depends on the vertical you're in so i would say that just based on again my experience with 4300 of my own customers that those lead sources are n not a good value for contractors for doctors and attorneys webmd you can get leads from that's not a good source attorneys there's legal zoom that's a fantastically expensive way to, to get the same lead 10 other attorneys get what you want to do in the contractor space again medical or legal in personal services or you do business to business services you really want to do a simple landing page that ranks well in a number of suburbs not in a major city, but in the suburbs around a city. Those are easier to capture with landing pages. Have a smart form on there. Have a video on there. You'll get leads. Then they'd be exceedingly inexpensive because you're not paying by the lead. You're not competing with 10 other people who are calling the guy at the same time. Because if somebody submits themselves on Angie's list, then all of the contractors who agreed to pay for that lead get them at the same time. Their phones are going crazy. It's not a good way to get leads. If you're a wedding planner, is the not the way to do it? I don't know. If you're a chauffeur, is the not a good way to get leads? I don't know. It really depends on what industry you're in. You can't run a restaurant without DoorDash, Uber Eats. Whether they like those platforms or not, the fact that everybody's on there tells us that's a necessary evil, if you want to call it that. Seems like everybody's fighting to get every dollar's worth that they can when they go into these promotional spaces like social media. Everybody here is, go on social media. You're going to get everybody and their mother, because everybody and their mother's on Facebook, right? If you own a restaurant, you better have a Facebook following, right? If you are a musician, you got to have a Facebook following following. All that is for you as a roofer is a brochure because nobody goes to Facebook looking for a roofer. If there was a storm last night and, and I've got water coming in to my attic or it's dripping through the ceiling, right? And the sheet rock's bubbling up. I'm not saying, let me go to Facebook and see how many likes this guy has, or let me go to Facebook and see who my friends can recommend to me. I'm going to go straight to Google. I'm doing it hundred percent of the time on my phone because I'm literally walking around my house as I do it. I'm going to use Google maps to find the closest roofer to me. And I'm going to get on the phone and call him literally right now. If I go to a website to check him out, then I need a smart form. It needs to have a pop-up that converts me. It's all Google search at that point.
right. Social media does nothing for me. Saying this, so we know that in the most basic format, take radio. Maybe the demo for a certain station is females age 18 to 30. Is there a 15 year old listening to the radio station? Of course. Yeah. Are there any 50 year olds? Yes, of course. It's picking the demographic that fits you. You don't need everybody and their mother on Facebook. Yeah. For your business, you just need the right business people. The word artificial intelligence nowadays, they'll put that on everything. I think it's a buzzword this year. It's funny is it's like yeah. if they had just invented radios and there was a button instead of seek, they called it the AI button. And it says, listen, this is an intelligent button. It will intelligently determine what's the next station that has a good enough signal. They would call it the AI button today. It wouldn't call it a seek That's button right. Right. because they want to put that tag on everything. What's on your guys' radar? These platforms, I think, are the ones to watch. Do you know 100% of graphic artists have Canva on their resume? And that's neat because what it means is that you don't, I, if I'm hiring you as a graphic artist out of school, I don't have to train you. You already know the platform that we're going to use. Adobe, Premiere Pro, every single person has used that to edit video. Edit. Accountant is using QuickBooks. And the accountants are using QuickBooks. So so I think if there's a big change coming, obviously ChatGPT is one of those tools, right? It's a platform. But I think if we're trying to say, okay, what's going to be transformative to work five years from now? It's going to be something that's a branded tool of some kind. And it's just going to kind of come out of nowhere. It'll always, of course, inspire fear. How, how many graphic artists thought anybody can make their own logo now on Canva? And yet, hey, more companies have logos than ever before. But then we'll wake up tomorrow and there'll be another thing. You'll know it because one of your young employees will ask you, are you using blank? Young employee or your kids? The internet has made trillions of dollars for people. Restaurants need social media. Anything that's entertainment related, leisure related, needs social media in a big way. It's hard to put into words what's next. If you look at a few years ago, Facebook and a bunch of other companies were dumping hundreds of millions or more maybe into virtual reality. And then AI became the buzzword last year and then tech layoffs started and all this fun stuff's going on where now we're not focused on virtual reality so much as we are the AI. Now everybody's racing to market with their different AI products. What I think is changing or what I think is coming immediately is continued evolution of these AI products, the way that it curates perhaps responses for individual users. I think what's really coming around the corner is probably some of the big name enhancements of the personal assistants, the AI we used to know and love, who still ask Siri or Alexa for anything today if it's not chat GPT. I still ask Siri to do stuff for me sometimes, but what if it had those AI integrations and capabilities? What if you could ask Siri to generate documents on the fly from a 20-word request or something to her real quick? Google, Alexa, I see all the big names, Amazon, Google, Apple, they're all probably coming out with their own versions of AI assistants that are not just going to tell us fun responses, but they're going to be curated for us individually based on uh, the accounts, profiles, all the information they have on us. I, I think it's going to blow that lid off of everybody who hasn't heard of it yet. They're going to know what it is by the year 2024 or 2025, and Siri is going to be their new best friend again. Yeah, this is the year of AI, and I think even if they haven't heard of ChatGPT, they've heard of AI, it's taken on a life of its own. Opposite is true of a virtual reality. I mean, they spent billions of dollars, no one cares. Christmas before last, we all bought the headsets, right? Yeah. My kids got one. It's sitting on the floor in my office, not in its case. It's not used. It's just going nowhere. The experience isn't great. The business application is really dubious. Like, I really think VR isn't going to go anywhere, even now that Apple's into the game. If you remember in 1994, you did not have a cell phone. In 1995, you did. In 1994, you'd never been on the internet. In 1995, you were on it all the time. When these things hit us, you'll know it. You don't have to feel like you're getting left behind. It just comes over like a wave. With some exception with social media, some of us never got onto social media. Facebook is sort of dying, and that's okay. And it's too late for me to really get into it because it's old, old people now. <laughs> well, hey, I appreciate you guys. Appreciate you coming in. Appreciate your business and your partnership and everything you guys do. You guys, join us in the next one. Hope you got something good out of this. We'll see you soon. <laughs>